Hello, and help me welcome Bill O'Brien, the foremost Speaker of the House in 2011 and 2012. All right. Yes, Very yes, good. Yes, Back yes. again and in there for fighting for Ward uh, 9, right? I, I am. I'm running in, uh, for state representative again. I put five terms in, but this is a new district for me. I've been off a couple of terms because um, whether or not we formally have it, I think any um, state representative always ought to keep in mind that you've been up there for a while, and now it's time to go and kind of uh, rejuvenate your thoughts on mm -hmm. issues. Um, hopefully, do what I did: start a company and and uh, you know see see um, how politics works, oh, not yeah. just from the elected official mm -hmm. um, perspective, but from the recipient <laughs> of all their acts. acts and we and have so to forth. welcome you in Nashua too. You had to move from. Uh, uh, well, I did. Yeah, I, I uh, decided, like a lot of folks, that um, plowing a 700-foot driveway, in my case, was <laughs> something I just didn't care to do <laughs> for for longer. And so we looked around and, and you know, came obviously no Nashua, but came across an opportunity to live. Um, in Nashua, in, in Ward 9, and up mm -hmm. Sky Meadow, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. I thought, this is just delightful. This is just what we've been looking for. And it's been a great move. You know, the, the, the nice thing about Mount Vernon, it's a small town, and we, mm -hmm. we really enjoy getting to know f people really well there. The not-so-nice thing is if you wanted to go to, you know, get your groceries, you had to drive a half hour. <laughs> you know, and, and if you wanted to, you know, pop down the store to, yeah. to um, get uh, anything, it was, or go get some coffee it was it was a uh, a trek so it's nice being among um all these services and uh -huh. you know and, and sky meadow itself is just just a really great place to live a lot of good neighbors around yeah there. yeah really enjoying it well you got a, a big job you have to oust one of uh, three at least one of the three Republicans, I mean the Democrats that are there. Well, this, this is, it shouldn't be a hard thing to do. I, I, w I would think that in this election particularly where um, politics is so much in front of us oh, on yeah. the national level and the state level that people are going to be attentive. And if they're attentive to the current the Democrat incumbent, they're going to come across folks that have done the ridiculous. They've mm -hmm. done things like uh, voted to ban wood stoves in New Hampshire. Um, They've, they've done the, this seriously disruptive. They've, mm -hmm. They uh, voted a law that would have put a $168 million income tax on um, the people of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been new. We've avoided uh, sales taxes, income tax. Um, it's pr that, that choice has been um, a good one over the years. Even during this time of um, the, the virus pandemic, um, we have the strongest uh, economy in the, in the Northeast. Right. We're, you know, we're, we're not suffering the same degree of unemployment that other economies have. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, uh, if you look at all the indicia of social health, co uh, mm -hmm. comparing New Hampshire, not just in the Northeast, but that there is a good comparison, but across the, the country, we have uh, one of the richest states. We have one of the... Um, healthiest states. Our kids are growing up in, in intact families more than in other uh, uh, states. Um, our, our, uh, our median income is, is high. You know, you look at all these, these things you, that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, demographers will look at and say, is this a healthy society? Is this not? And, and New Hampshire ranks very, very high. Our, our violence crime is very yeah. low. And, all. And, and I have to s say that that's because we have had in the past an attitude among all the voters that the least amount of government is the best amount of government. And um, if people can do for themselves, they should do for themselves. And if they can do through their local governments, then they should do through their local governments. And only um, when it becomes absolutely necessary should we move up to the state level. That's why I'm running, because the current representatives have made different choices. They've, they've chosen to grow government. Um, they've chosen to... Um, uh, enact more regulations, and and that's just not the direction that I, I think New Hampshire needs, and, and the people in Nashua need. Well, that's what you found when you became speaker in uh, 2011, uh, that they had a big shortfall of the uh, budget, and that you were able to come out with a budget uh, that was balanced and uh, made up uh, for th for that shortfall. Carl, I think you were there the term before I became speaker along with me, and you re might remember that every time they would enact a new tax right. or a new fee on the people of New Hampshire, 
Um, and, and in the end, they, they, they became pretty distracted by that. Right. I would always get, go up and say, this is tax number 79 this term. And I think <laughs> we got it up to, if, correct me if I'm wrong, 84 separate taxes That's and fees. That was in that name. And, yeah. and, and despite all that additional taxing, right. what happened was that when the economy turns down, as it always does, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that is a linear progression right. all the time. It dips and it grows a little and so forth. And sometimes. we had, had a little bit of a, a recession. Mm -hmm. Nationally, it's a, a pretty big one. New Hampshire, as always, did a little bit better. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. 2010, um, the, the, the drop in revenues resulted in a $1 billion deficit. They taxed us more. If you remember, they added a yep. huge amount on the uh, surcharge and the motor vehicle registration fee. Mm -hmm. And so we came and we said, we're not going to uh, cover that $1 billion, almost $1 billion yeah. shortfall. The steady spending and revenue coming in, there was about a, almost a billion dollar shortfall. And by the way, we're going to give people back that motor vehicle surcharge, another 80 or 90 million dollars out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do that, I think, very comfortably by looking at government. And this is what we need to do now. Again, we have to look at government and say, at this level of government, what does it have to do? What it, does it have to do? And at this level of government, what has it been doing that we have to start to wind down, but you can't take away because mm -hmm. people become dependent on it? Mm -hmm. And then what is the absolute ridiculous things that it, it's doing? And, and we came up with a surprising amount of the third category, enough so that not only did we not have to increase any taxes, but as I said, we were able to give back that surcharge, mm -hmm. motor vehicle registration surcharge. We were able to reduce 13 additional taxes and the result was that the economy in New Hampshire, as always, took off in a much stronger way than the, the rest of its mm -hmm. sister states in New England and indeed um, throughout the, the, uh, the nation. And with those tax saving, savings, as a result of the surpluses we started right. growing, we were then able to turn in subsequent legislative terms and start, redu start reducing the business tax. When I became speaker, we had, uh, I think it was in the top five yeah. when it came to mm -hmm. um, uh, business taxes. That was the, the kind of the weak underbelly of New Hampshire. Personal, prop uh, the personal taxes weren't too bad, but the two areas we had to work on were property mm -hmm. taxes. We had to work on business taxes. And we started this process to reduce business taxes. Mm -hmm. And we were able to bring it down to the lower half compared to all the other states in the country. Again, that, that added to jobs here in New Hampshire. Up until COVID came along, we mm -hmm. had historically low unemployment rates, historically high business formation um, rates. And, and we know how to produce that. We have to have people that want to go up there and produce it. Not like the, th uh, the, the three folks who are running uh, as incumbents in Ward 9, mm -hmm. who all of whom not only voted for income tax, they voted for a 12.5% yeah. increase in business taxes. Mm -hmm. Taxes on the, the, the small businesses, because New Hampshire is a, a state of small mm. businesses that give all of us our jobs. Right. They're yeah. the ones that just drop out of, of the business area. If they yeah, yeah. And so, so, so um, y you know, I, I looked at that. I, you know, I, when I left after five terms, I'd been, you know, 10 years as state representative. And, and uh, you know, as you know, it's a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. you, you don't get anything for it, $100 a year or something, which we'd always donate any <laughs> to something anyway. Um, they even take taxes out of that. Yeah, they did take, yeah, <laughs> out of the hundred, we'd get like $86 or mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. And then we'd, we'd sign over the chep, check to some charity or another. And, and um, y y y y y when I left, I said, you know, I've, I've done it. This is civic duty. It's like, you know, a lot of people in, in New Hampshire do um, mm -hmm. um, volunteer work. They'll join a school board. Mm -hmm. They'll join a board of aldermen for a while. They'll join a... Uh, informal committee to, to advise uh, various portions of the, of the government. That's how New Hampshire works, a volunteer government. And so I figure, well, I've done it. Let, let somebody else get up there. They may have some ideas. Um, but I'm looking at just, just the madness that's going on in the state, and it reflects this, this craziness that's going on um, in the country. And it reflects it in very, very um, 
are stark new ways. Mm -hmm. The last House session, the, the, the New Hampshire House of Representatives has been meeting over at the Whittemore Center mm -hmm. in UNH so they can have social distancing. Right. The last House, center, uh, uh, house session, um, we were faced with something I thought I would never see in New Hampshire. There, there were Democrat state representatives who, when the time came to pledge allegiance, the time came for a national anthem, took a knee, showed really? disrespect. Disrespect. You know, I, my, my dad was, was a, a member of the greatest generation. He, he um, joined the military, mm -hmm. you know, going to Northeastern, uh, dropped out of, of Northeastern, joined the military two months after uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, did well. You know, ended up going to officer uh, candidate school. Uh, ended up retiring as a colonel. Spent 30 years. In mm. he, was, he was in World War II. He was in the Korean War. He was in Vietnam. Okay. Yeah, he's, he, two months. Uh, the war started in, uh, in, in uh, World War II. Started two months uh, uh, before he joined, and he got out two months after he got back from Vietnam. Mm. And and. Um, you know, I, I see someone taking their knee as showing disrespect to my father and to that generation and to the current uh, young mm -hmm. people, the, the best of our country, mm -hmm. who are selfishly putting their lives on the line to keep us to, uh, free. And th this is a disrespect. You know, last year, I think it was, um, I went to the Army-Navy game down in Philadelphia, the football game. Yeah. And you contrast the rioters oh, and, and, yeah. and, and these people that call themselves Antifa for anti-fascists, but they are the fascists. They're the shock mm -hmm. troops right. of the radical left of the Democrat Party. They're mm -hmm. the violent shock troops, just as in the 1920s, the shock troops of the Democrat Party was the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. These are the current shock troops. And you, you, you look at those people and then you compare them with these midshipmen and these cadets they saw. And you've got to do that at times because it, it's heartening to say, yeah, my country still has a future. <laughs> so, No, it's, it's uh, a shame that the, uh, the younger people, I guess, uh, in a way, are the ones that uh, don't see anything about our history and how we built up this uh, uh, great country. Uh, went through lots of changes. And we got better each time. Let us be clear with what is happening. We, we've seen it over the last week, mm -hmm. and it's developed um, out of sight in our schools, and now the uh, result of it's becoming ev evident. What is happening is that people are being denied information. They're being given false narratives. Mm -hmm. our, our kids graduate from high school, now even college, not knowing who America is. I was listening to this interview with uh, Victor Davis Hanson, who is a mm -hmm. um, well-known historian. He's, he's um, uh, at the Hoover Institute, uh, which is part of Stanford University. He's a professor at Hillsdale College. He's published probably about 20 different books in history. He's an acknowledged expert in the country on, on Greek um, history. <coughs> and he said, you know, recently, and for, for him, he's, he's 65, 70, he said, recently, uh, when I ask kids, you know, what do you know about World War II? He said, often they don't know what side the United States fought on um, in, in World War II. They don't know what the issues were. No. He, he said, um, they, he'll ask them, well, what do you know? And they'll say, well, we know the Holocaust. And, you know, and, and the interviewer is saying, well, that's kind of good. You know, we know the Holocaust. Tell me about the Holocaust. Oh, yeah, America imprisoned some Japanese um, <laughs> Uh, uh, American citizens, and oh, by the way, we bombed uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. <laughs> um, and they, that's all they know. Yeah. That, that's all they know. They, they don't know about the, the, the reasons that the United States exactly. and Britain had to stand up to these totalitarian right. regimes. They don't know the sacrifice of their fathers. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know that America's position in the world was mm -hmm. that no matter who was fighting it, when the time came uh, for war to end, they wanted the Americans to end the war. One of the, 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 there's often a question, why did the Germans keep on fighting on in World War II when it became evident in, in the beginning after January, after the Battle of Auschwitz? It's because they wanted to hold the Russians off so everybody could get to the Americans and the British. Mm -hmm. That's the type of an exceptional country we are. And, and, and yet the, the left 
Um, it wants uh, young people to think that we are the worst thing in the world rather mm -hmm. than the best thing that's ever happened to the world. And, 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 it's, uh, and, and I say, you know, we, we see it in our schools, but we see it over the past week. The, over the past week, news came out, emails came out, showing that all of what um, John, uh, Joe Biden has been saying about not knowing about his son's corruption um, is, is false. He said, well, you know, maybe he was getting a million dollars a year to be on this company in Ukraine, well, which was under investigation for corruption mm -hmm. um, while I was the point man for the Obama administration and, and pressuring uh, Ukraine. And, oh, yeah, you do have me on tape you know, yucking it up about how I got a prosecutor who was prosecuting that company um, fired, but I knew nothing about, nothing <laughs> about it at all you know, what he was doing. And emails came out, and, and he, oh, he also said, and I never met with anybody. I never right, talked right. to him about it. I never met with any, uh, anybody from that company. Emails came out showing that he had met with somebody and that, he, that um, his son had talked with him. And then those weren't the worst emails, despite showing Joe Biden was, was lying to us, yeah. lying to mm -hmm. us. And, and the, the worst part of that is that the, me the media is trying to keep that from us. People don't know it. I, I dare say people watching this broadcast, or some of them will never have heard about it because I even went to the Wall Street Journal today and you had to go into about page 14 or 15 really? before you came across anything about it. And, and all you came across was an article saying, Republicans upset. <laughs> about this. I mean, it's, it's the old story that, that you know, when it comes to Republican corruption, it's on the first page, and the, article, the title of the article says Republican corruption. You come across Democrat corruption, it's on the back page, and the article starts off saying Republicans pounce <laughs> <laughs> to talk about, you know, it's, it's the same thing, but it's, a, yeah. but, but it's, not, it's not the worst part of it. Today, emails came out showing that uh, that there were millions of dollars given to the Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's brother, Joe Biden's sister-in-law, oh, yeah. the children, and then there's a chart that a came out. Yeah, I got that, that chart too. Yeah, Boy, the chart says, amazing. you know, who's going to own relatives. this? Yeah, who's going to own this company? Mm -hmm. And it said oh, Hunter and Jim Biden, the brother, and Sarah, the sister-in-law, and 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 then it said, and then Joe's going to hold ten percent of the company on behalf of the big guy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the type of thing that if there was a press here that functioned as it did 50 or 60 right. years ago, they would be saying to themselves, oh boy, here we go, this is what we want, yeah. you know, this is, these are juicy stories. Instead, what happened? Never, never shows up on CNN, never shows up on ABC, they interviewed Joe Biden last night. George Stephanopoulos does. He doesn't even ask him about it. Right. I mean, he doesn't even ask him about it. And, and um, we have Twitter and Facebook taking down accounts that have the, the audacity to even mention that it's right. going on. Right. You know, we, you, people can look at this and say, oh, you belly-aching Republicans. Right. You know, uh, why are you always saying it, it, it's it's not us so much. Look, at, I'll do well in life. I've done well, and in, in, you know my, my years are going on here. Um, certainly, I care about my children, but they're they're hardworking kids. Yeah. You know, one's an assistant district attorney, and the other does very very well in her career, and all. They're they're doing just fine. My family's doing fine. What I despair over are the voters who are being with, uh, mm -hmm. are not allowed to know what they need to know to make a, a logical and a reasonable decision, an informed decision. Benjamin Franklin, the story goes, when he was leaving the Philadelphia Convention last session, that the, the, if, if people may not be aware of it, all the sessions had been in secret. Mm -hmm. um, they were pledged to uh, allow themselves to speak in candor and all, and then only at the end did they say, here's the product we came up with. And so they had the last session, they voted it, said, okay, this is <coughs> the, the reforms that we're looking for. This indeed is the Constitution we're looking for. And the story goes, uh, a woman, and people gather outside, a new momentous event has taken place. Mm -hmm. there. And a, a woman um, asked him, you know, Dr. Franklin, um, what kind of government did you give us? And he purportedly said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Right. And 
how are we, how are the people watching us, how are the people in Ward 9, how are the people in Nashua, in New Hampshire, in this country, going to keep a republic when they're being lied to, mm -hmm. when, when relevant information is being withheld from them, when, when um, you, you see the reaction to anything that comes out about um, uh, 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 bad, for, yeah. Yeah, bad for, for the Democrats, you come up with a narrative. Within five minutes, across the country, you have leftists in mainstream publications using the exact phrase, using the exact phrase. Yeah, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very serious situation. It really is. People ought to be outraged on their own behalf. Right. Not on my behalf. I mean, not, not on your behalf, Carl. No, you're not on Republicans' behalf. You ought to be outraged for what is being denied to them. Right. I, I think you're very white, uh, well spoken there. <coughs> I just hope that the Justice Department has some uh, activity that they're planning soon because there's a lot of uh, corruption in the government that people don't uh, know. What, what, what went through for the last couple of years is hidden from the people, as so, you said. So um, it, it can be very discouraging mm -hmm. because apparently this laptop um, has been in the hands of the FBI since December 2019. Now, you know, when, when, when I first heard that, and that, that's, that's clear, there was a subpoena, there's, mm -hmm. there's been, there's been um, publication, not in the mainstream media, but there's been publication of the, the subpoena. And, and um, they have the laptop. Now think of what that means, December 2019, um, a laptop that talks about Hunter Biden approaching his father on behalf of the, mm -hmm. the officials from Burisma, this oil company, and people uh, in the emails from those officials thanking Hunter Biden for the setting up the meeting and hey, allowing him to spend time with, with um, Joe Biden. That was part of the basis of the impeachment of the president. If you remember, there was that phone call in which the president purportedly sa said, yeah. you know, to the president of Ukraine, President Trump said to the president of Ukraine, um, you, you ought to investigate this. And, and the FBI never gave that information right. to the, the House of Representatives. And the House of Representatives, and quite frankly, a, a, a partisan vote, impeached the president. Ne during the trial, never stepped forward to say, oh, by the way, senators, we have this information. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to be aware that what the, the president's concerns were entirely legitimate mm. um, about the Bidens, that indeed there was some corruption that needed to be investigated. Mm -hmm. y and and th there is, um, you can understand the frustration of, of uh, a Donald Trump uh, or anyone who's frustrated. Oh, definitely. I think the uh, frustration here uh, with people like you who are running uh, because of what's happened in the last two to four years yeah. uh, here in uh, New Hampshire. We have uh, people going in that direction. Uh, we have a governor who had to do 57 vetoes one year and I don't know, uh, a little bit less the next year, but only because people piled the, the bills together. That's right, that's <laughs> right. No, I mean, if, if you go through the litany of really crazy litigation, right. uh, legislation that, that uh, came out of that session, and you wonder, what are you thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, just, just all sorts of new regulations. Um, you know, and, and it, it's funny, I've, I've um, tried to communicate through mailers with the, the people in Ward 9, and uh, one of the things I've, I've tried to point out to the people is that this whole um, defaming of America as being mm -hmm. imbued with systemic racism and systemic misogyny, the hatred of women, and so forth, it is, is uh, used to try to divide us because the opposition party, the Democrats, try to, to cobble together aggrieved groups to get mm -hmm. a majority uh, a vote out of aggrieved uh, uh, groups, but it's just wrong. You know, I, are, are there some racists out there? Sure, you know. Is it a lot less than when we were young? Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is. I mean, in, in my life, and I think the lives of most people, there's, an, there's a, a complete revulsion if anyone were ever to say something mm -hmm. that was racist and would speak right up. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone were to say anything that was anti-Semitic, would speak right up. 
um, if, if anyone were to, to categorize women as other than full participants in our society, in our politics, in our business, would speak right up. And to say that there's this systemic prejudice is just wrong. Yeah. It's in defaming and demeaning to our country. A country who has been accused of having institutional racism, even though we elected an African American as president of the state, I believe mm -hmm. right before Trump, and, and did so gladly, you know, that even folks like me who didn't vote for Barack Obama because I thought, you know, his politics are really to the mm -hmm. left, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not so sure they're going to be good for the country, was gladdened by the fact that there was this demonstration that right. we're no longer a nation of, of, uh, of uh, racists, and, and yet they still call us that way. And we're being called that way by the party of racists. That the party that was built upon slavery, mm -hmm. the party that uh, that brought our country into a civil war to to save right. slavery, the party that after that civil war um, enacted Jim Crow laws, segregationist laws mm -hmm. throughout the South, the party who who when we voted in the 1950s and the 1960s for civil rights acts voted a uh, majority against it. It took Republicans to pass that law. Mm -hmm. the, the party that had a president, Lyndon Johnson, who used the N-word to say, well, we're going to now turn to it because we'll get these people who will vote for us now 100 right. years if we can think, make them think it was us. Um, that's the party that, that um, Donald Trump is saying to him, and, every, and everyone should be saying to African American community, they're keeping you on the welfare plantation. Rise up. Just as Booker T. Washington understood that you have, and every uh, an immigrant group understand, you have to pull yourself up in this America. Mm -hmm. You can do it too. Yeah, and people don't know about Johnson and how he ran the country. I mean, he was something like they try to describe uh, tr uh, Trump now. He was a very uh, not clean mouth individual when he uh, talked to people. He had all sorts of problems down there in Texas. You know, Michael Graham from the Hampton Journal called me up and after one of Donald Trump's tweets and he said, you know, sure, the, the tweets aren't the best thing in the world. Look at his policies. Look right. at what he's done. Look at right. who he's appointed and change his name to Dwight Eisenhower. Right. And it's no different. Yeah. It's no different. He is a moderately conservative Republican and yet they, they say the worst things about him, and they have people believe it. They have people believe it w without yeah, evidence. That's you know? right. He's a they Nazi, you know, well, or he's a dictator. They don't even know what history means. Yeah. I mean, they pull a guillotine out in front of the White House yeah. and say, he's a dictator. You know something I, I know from history about dictators? They don't like you pulling guillotines <laughs> up to their house, <laughs> and they don't let you do that. I mean, it's a ridiculous right. rhetoric, ridiculous. Right, right. Well, you know, we're out of time. Unfortunately, yeah. Bill, congratulations on running and hope for everything works out right because we need somebody strong who can change what's happening here as well as the federal group. And we want a strong New Hampshire. We want a New Hampshire that can make choices for himself, who goes and looks at history and sees what was working should be continued and was what wasn't working should be Remove. New Hampshire has to return to the status in New England where all the other states look at it and say, right. wish we were like New Hampshire. Yeah, that's right. And New Hampshire doesn't wish they were like Massachusetts. Right, definitely. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for your time. And thank you for listening in. And please get out to vote. We need you to vote. And I hope you're voting Republican. We have a lot of good people up there that will help turn this state around. Thank you.